are the most powerful elected officials in, in our state. Power that they can use to build a better community. After tonight, we may have a better idea of who we want to vote for on June 3rd, and I thank the candidate for giving us the opportunity to get to know them. Here's some issues that I would like to see implemented. One of them is on recidivism. California is the second to the last in keeping the recidivism rate down. This record leaves a lot of room for improvement. Both officers have the power to implement creative rehabilitation programs that would provide confidence and job training skills that would cut down on recidivism. Uh, there's a county down in Los Angeles that has a women's prison, and one of the creative ideas that they have is that they have their inmates training service dogs. And those, the ones that train the service dogs, they are not coming back into the system, so that helps them. Maybe we'll be third to last instead. But hopefully our candidates are going to say, okay, we can't have this happening, so let's help our state get a better rate so that we don't have so much recidivism in our prisons. The second is a very important issue, and that is on mental health. Special training and services can be implemented by both offices to help with prisoners that have mental health problems. Mental health uh, prisoners can benefit from having trained medical staff to deal with their needs. Officers, when they're out on their on parole, they need to have more awareness of training uh, and what, Awareness training when when confronting the mentally ill, I'm sure that they probably get to know some of the members of the community and, and some of the members they probably realize they need to treat them a little bit differently and uh, that could be a big help. The third thing is that's really important, I think. There should be no tolerance for law enforcement misconduct. Neither office should put up with deputies or politicians engaging in unethical behavior. When these situ situations are dealt with in a no-nonsense manner, a precedent is set so things don't get out of hand. Like in Santa Rosa, I don't know if you've heard about this case that happened six months ago, but a young boy that was an eighth grader named Andy Lopez. Andy was killed by an officer who thought the air gun he was carrying was real. This type of event has a devastating effect on community. So we want those things <laughs> On the issue of drug offenses and racial profiling, both offices should take even-handed approach by applying the law without regard to color, ethnicity, or social class. Non-violent drug offenders should be sent to treatment centers. Both offices have the power to direct their staff to treat everyone with respect. Many of our community members, such as the houseless and undocumented, have been targeted and marginalized. Everyone needs to be treated fairly to build a solid, strong community. Sad to say, many of our powerful leaders today lack integrity. It's a trait that is crucial in who those we elect. On June 3rd, 
keep that in mind. Now I'll turn the program over to Steve Nicoli. He's our modest monitor, moderator this evening. And thank you, Steve. Thank you. Well, hello everyone and welcome. First, I want to, it seems to me like this model uh, mic that I have isn't really working. Can you folks hear me all right? Yes. Yes? yes. All right, I didn't think I needed a mic. Uh, I've been teaching for 32 years. Uh, I teach history here at College of the Sequoias, and this is a wonderful crowd. It's great of you to be here. It's good to see citizen involvement like this. Uh, it's also an excellent thing to have all four of these candidates coming here to uh, put themselves on the line. It's not an easy thing to put yourself out in public like this, uh, you know, naked to the world, and have people throw questions at you, and you know, come through all that. It takes a lot of guts to run for office. So I, I, I salute uh, the candidates, uh, the two here and the two that will go next. The uh, sheriffs won the toss and elected to receive. <laughs> And we will have the DAs uh, to come later. Uh, I would like to introduce to you uh, Rebecca Salgado, a COS student, who will be our <laughs> So, uh, I'll show the candidates, yes, what you're going to be doing here. Um, I'll be issuing a one-minute stop halfway through. You'll have two minutes for questions, and then a 15 minute <coughs> Or 15 seconds, I'm sorry, 15 seconds left to the talk, and then just general hand up means your time is over. <laughs> <laughs> okay. the, uh, the, the candidates will answer the same question. Uh, first, let me perhaps introduce you to the candidates. On the left is Mike Boudreau, and on the right, Dave Whaley. <laughs> So hopefully that uh, we can expeditiously move this along and be out of here in a reasonable hour. Uh, you know, please, uh, you know, applause, uh, cat calls, anything else. You know, save that for the end. Okay, can you hear me? Okay. Well, the governor was given a directive from the federal government to reduce our inmate population in the state of California by about 30,000 seniors. Much of that is now been given to uh, look closer. Uh, much of that has been given now to uh, our local communities uh, for us to handle the inmates that normally would have been in the prisons. The realignment money that we are receiving current, I in the last three years have worked in developing and bringing approximately $100 million of funding from the state into our county for brand new infrastructure. Oftentimes you hear infrastructure meaning <clears throat> to house more inmates, and that's not the design and scope behind the money. What we are doing is building brand new infrastructure with the idea of rehabilitation in our jail facilities in an effort to reduce our recidivism. The goal is truly in Tulare County is to keep people from returning to jail. How do you do that? Some of that money absolutely has to be spent innovating a new rehabilitation program for those in an effort to keep them from returning to the custody environment. We're coming up with brand new, great ideas. Some of that involves botany and learning about plants. Some of that involves learning about animal care and veterinary care. Some of that involves learning about dairies, most specifically to our environment here in Tulare County. Can we provide rehabilitation that allows them to return to work with a good quality of life with the idea that they're not returned to our jobs? Thank you very much, Mike. Uh, Dave, uh, how would you like to see our county spend its realignment money? Thank you for that question. You know, I think that the county is doing a pretty good job on the way they're spending the money now. Um, and, and from what I can understand, what I, what I find out through uh, research is, is that it's going uh, pretty well. Uh, one thing I've said for a number of years is that the, 
we have to change California's penal system. I've said for years that as taxpayers, we cannot afford to just keep building jails and prisons and stacking people up like cordwood, uh, especially those that, that don't really belong there. We have to figure out a way to keep the jail beds available for those that prey on the society, prey on the good people of this county. I want to keep them locked up. But for those people that have a chance to change, I think that the money is uh, should be well spent on the new programs and giving them the chance that, that they deserve. You know, our criminal justice system it is just that, it's a system. And sometimes in law enforcement, we forget that we have a system based upon the courts, based upon probation, the DA, the public defender, and law enforcement. And all those people need to work together to make, to make this happen. Yeah, for the for the good of the people, and I I think in Tulare County we're we're using that approach, and, and I agree with that. And as sheriff, I'll continue to do that. Uh, so um, all all in all, I think the money is being spent appropriately. I don't believe in building new jails all the time when we can keep some people out. Some people need treatment, especially those with addiction problems and mental health problems. Thank you. Uh, question two, then uh, Dave Whaley will answer that one first. Do you support civilian oversight of law enforcement? You know, that's something that's changed over the years, and civilian oversight of law enforcement has been going on the, in the major cities for years. And the, the more I'm involved now in this campaign, the more, the more I pay attention to politics. And I've always realized that that all of our public departments, all of our public officials work for us, the people. And I think the more we can get the, the community involved and the people involved, will 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 only improve the trust that they have in law enforcement. So so I don't think that's a bad thing to get citizens involved in, in law enforcement like that and have some oversight. Because really, if you're not doing wrong, you don't have anything to hide. And I think other other minds, other people involved with the different backgrounds than ours would only be beneficial. So yes, I would support it here. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mike Goudreau, big question number two. Do you support civilian oversight of law enforcement? You know, approximately eight months, <clears throat> eight months ago, I was appointed to be your acting sheriff. And I've been the sheriff for the last eight months. And I had a couple of people come to me and say, Mike, how does it feel? You really don't have a boss. You have no one to report to. Well, I have to tell you, I report to every one of you sitting in this room. And so in my belief that in law enforcement, it's a good thing. It's a good thing to get an opinion from the citizens of this community as to how their sheriff department is operating and running, the function, the very scope and design, that the input from the community is so extremely important. And I believe for us to have safe communities, the safest possible communities, involves not just law enforcement, it involves our community. And if we don't have our community involved, hand in hand, walking side by side, in an effort to make our communities the safest possible, we're getting ourselves. If, for law enforcement, we have input from every one of you sitting in this room, I'll tell you, we're all gonna be better for it. I, as the sheriff, with changes most recently, I believe that every idea is important. And every input and opinion is important. I don't care if you're the lowest level, lowest paid person in our department, your opinion matters. And when it comes to those opinions plus the opinions of the public, I truly believe that that is important. And I would support the civilian and citizen oversight in the sheriff department for a better and safer. Thank you. Uh, third question. Well, I think I might have forgotten to um, announce to you that at the end of the questions that uh, each candidate will have a, a three-minute time period to make their uh, personal statement. So question three for Mike. Uh, do you support rehabilitation programs in prison, jail, and in the local community? If so, how would you advocate to continue expanding funding for these programs? Well, that's simple. We absolutely have to have rehabilitation programs. 
We currently have many rehabilitation programs in our correctional environment now. We have general education programs, we have programs that help you to come off addictions. We have a variety of new innovative ideas that are coming into the future that we believe is going to be very successful. We work very closely with the AB 109 committee, which consists of our district attorney as well as the public defender and probation, sheriff's department, and a judge. And in that committee, we specifically speak to the future of our county for the next 20 years. If you're not looking to the future of this county 20 years from now, you're behind. Things have to be looked at and innovative. And I think that the more rehabilitation that we're able to provide to the good citizens of this county as well as those that are incarcerated, the overall goal, absolutely, as I had mentioned before, is to provide a safer community, the safest possible community. And if you can get someone to change their life or provide an opportunity, alternate opportunities, that's the key. Making sure that they know that there's someone out there that cares and that you don't have to be stuck in the rut that you're in. Or if you're addicted to a drug or a narcotic for whatever reason, if we don't take the effort as the citizens of this county to try and break that habit and to change the mold, then all we're doing, as indicated before, is incarcerating people, building jails, and stacking them on top of each other. We have to do everything we can to look out for our neighbor. And so I absolutely support rehabilitation programs. I will continue to go to Sacramento, federal government, wherever I need to go as the sheriff to provide the safest possible communities for our citizens. Thank you. Uh, same question number three for you, Dave. Do you support rehabilitation programs in prison, jail, and in the local community? If so, how would you advocate to continue expanding funding for these programs? I do very much uh, support those programs in prison and in local jails. One of the reasons that AB 109 occurred and, and local or uh, state inmates got referred back to our jails is because CDCR, the state prison system, has done a terrible job at trying to rehabilitate individuals. You talk about just stacking people up with, with no service to them whatsoever. Uh, they, they, I think they're one of the worst in the nation, and that's why the federal courts ruled against the state, and that's why we ended up with AB 109. And sometimes things happen, we think it's a bad deal, but it happens for a reason. You know, when I was an under sheriff, when I worked for the sheriff's department for 34 years, we always knew that these programs, a lot of these evidence-based programs would work. The problem we had then is no one would give us the money. So, so today with AB 109 and the idea that finally the people in Sacramento with the purse strings have figured out we can't keep stacking people up like this. We have to do something to reduce the recidivism rate. We have to do something for these individuals. When it's evidence-based uh, and proven to work, uh, I totally agree with it. But I also know that some, some people should not be given the chance to program. Some people that have multiple uh, crimes against them, a long history of violent crimes, need to be locked up. And as sheriff, I'm going to be the sheriff for everyone in Tulare County, and some people just have to be locked up. We can talk about these programs all we want, and they're good for certain individuals. And that's how we keep our bed space for the people that need to be in jail we need to have these programs that are evidence-based. I would go to Sacramento, I would work with the CSSA, the California State Sheriff's Association, to try to keep this money coming, and really work closely with the partnership in the whole CJ system that I mentioned, especially probation. I think we're doing a great job. Thank you. Uh, question four. Uh, there are 13 questions, by the way. <laughs> I, I just got this vibe that people were wondering. <laughs> so question four for Dave. Uh, do you support sending young offenders to restorative justice programs and other avenues that divert people out of the juvenile justice system and toward new opportunities? If so, what would you do as sheriff to promote these programs? Well, it, it's, it's really a lot the same as the question I just answered. As long as it's a, there are evidence-based programs that are proven to work. But, but as the sheriff, 
I'm going to be more responsible, for, I'm going to be responsible for adult inmates, but obviously in the enforcement side, we contact juveniles every day. We arrest juveniles and bring them to the juvenile justice system. So I do, I would be open-minded to something like that. That's something that, I'm not the expert in juvenile justice, but our chief probation officer is. I would work closely with Christy Meyer and see that those programs are evidence-based, and if it's something we can do, it's better to work with a young person that has a chance to turn their life around than it is that even adults that may have been hooked on drugs or mentally ill for a number of years. So it, it would be a, it would be a benefit to the society and a benefit to the sheriff's department and all concerned that you work closely with the juveniles because they have a better chance of, uh, of changing their life than, than an adult does. Thank you. Uh, Mike, same question. Uh, number four, do you support sending young offenders to restorative justice programs and other avenues that divert young people out of the juvenile justice system and toward new opportunities? If so, what would you do as sheriff to promote these programs? Well, we currently don't do that. The district attorney is great at restorative justice. I, during my master's program, I, I studied a lot in reference to restorative justice. Restorative justice really involves the offender. It involves the, the, the community, and it also involves the victim. Uh, a lot of times in restorative justice, the victim is allowed to confront the offender. And so I know that it's very delicate, and I know that this district attorney uh, does a great job uh, at, at their restorative justice programs. I know that they've been successful. I have studied the restorative justice programs and for, for specific situations it's very unique, but it is very successful. I think that there are cases that become more difficult than others to implement restorative justice. Uh, those specifically maybe to rape or child molestations, but I know that they've been used and I also know that they've been successful. And I think that we absolutely have to make sure and stay on top of every program that's available uh, for any type of healing to the victim or the potential for an offender to come out of reoffending. And restorative justice has been proven to be successful, but I do believe that it's very unique and case by case. Uh, however, I do support it, and I do agree that the earlier that you can reach someone to give them options for opportunities of change, if restorative justice is one of those options in an effort to make that change, then absolutely. I would support restorative programs and I would work closely with our district attorney's office as well as our probation department and our local law enforcement um, with the other chiefs of police in this county, uh, which, we, which we are currently doing. So I do support that. Now I'm talking, when I, when I, let me clarify what I'm going to say here, with drug offenders, that covers a lot of category. I'm, I'm saying people that have been, uh, that are addicted, illicit drugs, people that just have, are arrested for being under the influence or possession of illegal drugs, uh, that's something that I can agree with, to try to send them to treatment. Uh, that is a lot like being an alcoholic or, or anything else uh, in the way of a medical problem that can be changed with the appropriate treatment. Where I, I don't believe in that is when someone is, has possession enough that they're selling it, or we've arrested them for selling drugs, then to me, some people I hear them discuss it, that to them that's still a, uh, a minor offense, it was just a little bit of drugs. When you are out selling drugs to the community and selling drugs that poison for our children, then that's something that, that I don't agree with. That's a, that is violence as far as I'm concerned, and that's when we have to put people in jail. But as far as simple possession, the person that is addicted and needs help getting off of it, of course it's against the law to be under the influence. It's against the law to possess any of it. And, and it should be against the law. But those are the kind of lawbreakers that I think we should work on to see if we can't get them appropriate treatment and get their addiction turned around. Thank you. Uh, I think I might have, uh, did I skip a question here? Yeah. I, I, yeah, I went to Dave and you were supposed to be answering number four, which Mike had already addressed. Uh, restorative, did you develop the answer to restorative? I started without it. Okay. 
Okay, so Mike was supposed to do the low-level drug offenders first. But they, so would you mind doing that one now, Mike? What do you think is the most effective way to deal with low-level drug offenders? I don't get a gimme. <laughs> <laughs> okay, go ahead. We're doing a great job in the county, county as a whole, low-level drug offenders, and, and I wouldn't limit it to low-level drug offenders. I'll tell you, I sit every year in Ropers, where they call them Ropers Topers, but I sit in that drug court every year and I see that graduation ceremony of over 200 people who have been addicted to drugs at one point or another, sold drugs at one point or another, and were convicted of high-level felonies that absolutely have taken their life and turned it around. I am for arresting the bad guys and the violent offenders and the drug dealers and putting them in jail, and that's where they belong. But we're talking about rehabilitation programs for the future and the reduction of recidivism, changing lives in our community. I wouldn't limit it to just low-level drug offenders. I would open up the option to everyone to give them the opportunity for change. Many people make mistakes. Many people have done things that they regret. And they've ended up incarcerated and wish they hadn't have been there and just fighting for someone to give them the opportunity to change their life. Not just the low-level drug offender. We in the county, if we can provide opportunities for change at every level, I support it at every level. Rehabilitation, that provides a safer community for you and I, for my family, the ability to live next to someone who have offended at one time or another, despite the level of which they offended at, that now you're safe, they're safe, and it's a better environment for all. So although the question did specifically designate the low-level offender, I wouldn't limit to that. And any time that any of us limit the ability or, or limit the options for change in anyone who's, who's hit a rough spot in their life, we have to be able to provide that opportunity. Now for those that reoffend and they kick dirt to the wind and they never want to take a hold of that opportunity, it's hard for us to continue to make that change or, or to make that push first.